an original MCM production. We have a great program in store, and with that, I'd like to call upon David Buck, who will take it from here. Thank you, President Joanne. President Trump's current visit to Asia has not appeared to have eased the tensions of, between the United States and North Korea. Today, in this slide, you see three American nuclear aircraft carriers and their airplanes that are, uh, that are sailing off the coast of Korea as part of a demonstration of American power trying to overawe uh, the North Koreans. This standoff between the United States and the, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is not new, but has escalated in the past year because of North Korean rocket and nuclear capacities. Today, to discuss the growing nuclear crisis, we are fortunate to have with us Philip Yun of the Plowshares Fund, a 35-year-old organization that's working to eliminate the threats posed by nuclear weapons. Philip is executive director and Chief Operating Officer of the Plowshares. He has been with them since 2011 and has a long career as a diplomat and a specialist in nuclear weapons control with special interest in North Korea. I have been a long-term supporter of Plowshares because I have seen how Plowshares has been increasingly successful to limit nuclear proliferation through treaties such as the Iran Nuclear Agreement and greater public understanding of the threat which nuclear weapons pose to us all. I have asked uh, for Philip to do, do his presentation today in an interview format and interviewing will be Douglas Savage, a valued colleague of mine at the, at the Institute of World Affairs from the University of Wisconsin. Doug and I have worked together on a wide variety of international issues since uh, during, before my retirement, and he continues as a regular interview for, on the monthly TV program, International Focus, shown on Milwaukee's Channel 10. Philip, Doug, I'll let you come up here. And Well, thank you, David. And uh, probably the best part of my job is having the opportunity to interact with uh, some of the, the smartest people I've ever run across. And, and David is very high on that list. And I think as the next several minutes will uh, amply illustrate, our guest is as well. So, Philip, maybe we could start with uh, just some sense of where we are right now. It's a very fluid situation, but uh, what, what is the current status? So before I answer that question, uh, which I'm constantly asked when I'm on television and, and do interviews, first I wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak at Rotary. Uh, I um, have a long history in speaking to various Rotary clubs all over the country. Um, I believe that uh, Plowshares Fund and Rotary uh, we're, we're a form of community and public service. And so when I have the opportunity to speak in front of a Rotary Club, I jump at it immediately. Because I think uh, for us, and particularly in these times, I think community service is more important than ever. 
And uh, we at Plowshares Fund is very much involved in public affairs and, and trying to make the world a better place, which is what we're all trying to do. So um, thank you for all that you do. And hopefully uh, with Rotary specifically or other individuals from Rotary, we can all work together to accomplish that goal. Uh, so thank you. Uh, what's the current situation? Well, first, I will have to say that we know that uh, North Korea, if we continue to, if the U.S. policy continues as it is, North Korea at some point in the near future will have a small nuclear arsenal capable of hitting the United States. At this point, it is simply a matter of time. Louder, okay. So let me repeat that. North Korea at some point in the near future will have a nuclear tipped uh, missile that is capable of hitting the United States. We had a six test back in September. It was very large. 250 kilotons is the measure. Something like 15, 16 times greater than the explosion of Hiroshima. It was, we believe, uh, not confirmed, a hydrogen weapon. So that's one piece of this puzzle. We also know that North Korea has uh, has been working on its missiles. To give you a sense of where they are on these missiles, let me give you some historic background. So under the grandfather, Kim Il-sung, he conducted something like 16 missile tests during his relatively long reign, something like 20, 30 years. The father, Kim Jong-il, during his reign of about 17 years, conducted about 46 missile tests. The grandson, Kim Jong-un, who has been in power now six years, has done something at last count, 99. And so what you are seeing right now is North Korea doing short range, middle range, intermediate range, and long range testing. That's one set of missiles that's going on all on parallel tracks. They are also working on liquid and solid fuel, which uh, the differentiation is liquid fuel is usually from a stationary position, easier to detect. Solid fuel, you can move around, and they're, they're, they can respond much more quickly. And then among the solid fuel rockets, you have mobile, uh, which is land-based, and then you have sea-based, which is submarines. And obviously, if it's mobile, in, uh, you can go anywhere and you can't detect them. So the key then for North Korea is can they actually mate and put together a missile on top, I mean a, a nuclear device on top of these particular devices on these uh, delivery vehicles. And in the short and, short and medium term uh, uh, weapons, we believe they can. Uh, it is unclear about the longer term, but again, as I said, it's simply a matter of time. And us wishing it away or saying that the North Koreans aren't capable of doing that, I think really defies reason because, as I said before, at some point they will have that capability. And so right now we believe they have something like 25 to 30 nuclear device weapons or weapons worth of material. We don't know if they've actually weaponized them. And let me give you another figure here. North Korea is producing one nuclear weapons worth of material every eight weeks by our calculation. That means that over a period of time, what has been what was one or two nuclear weapons something like 15 years ago has become 25 to 30 now, and if you calculate that out, could be somewhere between 75 and 100. Um, and that's a significant problem. Well, as uh, someone who probably, like many people in the room, grew up ducking and covering from time to time in, uh, in school, the threat is often perceived of as a, a first strike. So, and you've, you've written that perhaps that's not the thing we should be most worried about in this situation. Right, right. So again, one of the questions that is always asked to me is, what's the real threat? And the first thing I say to people, what the threat, real threat is not. And the real threat is not a preemptive nuclear strike out of the air by North Korea on the United States. The thing that people have to remember is, and this is not talked about that often, it's the notion that deterrence, show of force, is actually alive and strong on the Korean Peninsula. In essence, North Korea knows that if it attacked the United States unilaterally without warning, that it would cease to exist. And this is all predicated, and we can answer, people can ask me the questions why this is the case. Let me underscore a myth here. The North Koreans are not suicidal. They're not irrational. 
they're very savvy about what they do and very intentional about this. So one of the things that one has to realize is that if that's the case, they know that, this, and this is one of the things I agree with Donald Trump and what they're doing is a show of force and deterrence. That's for that specific purpose. You attack, they're telling the North Koreans, you attack the United States, you will cease to exist. And that is one thing that I take a, a great amount of assurance in uh, that um, the North Koreans, again, will not, our uh, regime change is something that they are very concerned about, that's their overarching goal and, and objective, so they won't unilaterally attack. What I am concerned about, and I think David alluded to this a little bit earlier, is miscalculation. Miscalculation in the sense that right now, North Korea has something like a million man army. On the other side, you have South Korea, 450,000. U.S. troops, you have something like 80,000 both in Japan, 50,000 and about 20 or 30,000 in South Korea. On top of that, you have military exercises that have increased. We have, we were just talking about three carrier groups right now. We have something like a dozen F-35s and we have submarines floating around. That's a lot of military hardware floating around there right now. And so when you have these military exercises, what happens? What happens if, a, if North Korea tests a missile and it goes off course? What happens if there is a firefight between South Korean and North Korean naval vessels over fishing rights? in the East or West Sea? What happens if there's an exchange of fire between North Korea and South Korea, which we saw earlier, uh, they were reporting someone coming across the DMZ and someone gets killed? Things happen. And when you put it in the context of superheated rhetoric and escalation, there's always a chance that someone is gonna miscalculate. And you have basically on both sides, you have Kim Jong-un, who's relatively inexperienced, very aggressive, likes to be unpredictable, and you have on the other side arguably a president who's very much the same. That's a, that's, a, that's a volatile mix. And when both of them are not talking with each other and you have both sides trying to push the envelope, someone could miscalculate. That's what we're worried about. That's what you should be worried about. Well, uh, as you mentioned, there are devices probably dispersed throughout the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, in, in some quarters is eagerly anticipated is the collapse of the regime. But talk a little bit about what that might look like. So let me, what I talked about, miscalculation is what I'm concerned about over the shorter term. And then I talked about the notion of North Korea over a longer period of time having maybe anywhere between 50, 75 to 100 nuclear weapons worth of material. Well, what does that mean? And, what, and over the longer term, why am I concerned about that? Well, one, you know, if given the choice, I would rather not have North Korea having that capability of being able to hit the United States. That's number one. But again, because deterrence is really strong, what I am more concerned about and what we need to guard against is basically the sale of this material. So it's one thing, so let me give you a couple scenarios. Right now we're working on sanctions. What if sanctions work? Sanctions can work, uh, let's say China does actually do what they say they're going to do, and we have bone crushing sanctions. Well, there are two possibilities here. Um, you have one or two nuclear weapons worth of material 15 years ago, let's say now you have 25 to 30, and at some point you're gonna have 75 to 100. There's a huge difference between those, why? That material, those weapons are all probably not in one place, that's my guess. They're probably scattered in different places all around the country. We don't know where they are. So if there is a, if there is a sanctions that are truly bone crushing, and I'm a person in charge of this material, and we're talking something the size of a grapefruit that can level a city. That's what people want. So if my family is starving because of these sanctions, and someone comes to me and offers me $1 million, $5 million for this, do I have a greater incentive to sell this? I think that's probably the case. I mean, the thing that we heard over the spring, we heard ISIS was in Europe looking around at nuclear facilities trying to see what they could do. What happens then if bone-crushing sanctions work to the point where the regime starts to collapse? And then let's think about a unilateral strike or let's say war, which we can exp I can talk about a little bit later why I don't think that is an option, but let's just play this theoretical game a little more and we have a, an all-out war. And besides possibly 100,000 to even millions of people, million people dying based on how this all unfolds with chemical, biological weapons, 
So then basically you have North Korea that is ungoverned, and I guarantee you there's gonna be a mad race to find that material. Let's say 75 to 100 nuclear weapons material, something the size of a softball, that no one is not quite sure where it is. So again, it's one thing to have one or two. What if you have 75? I think that the chances are pretty high that at least one of those things will get out of North Korea. And if that's the case, we um, at Plowshares, one of the things that we're working for is to reduce the threat and eliminate nuclear weapons so not, it will never, one will never explode again. But if one of these gets out of North Korea without being secured, chances are it will blow up either the United States, Western Europe, or somewhere in the Middle East. So again, that's the concern that we have to guard against. And quite frankly, when I was in government, it was one of the nightmare scenarios that we had to think about constantly. We often see in the American media the regime characterized as, you know, you've alluded to this sort of irrational, just a bunch of crazy people doing crazy things. What is the calculus that drives the quest for a nuclear capability. So again, I will, I, I'll, I'll present why I believe the North Koreans are incredibly rational and very thoughtful in the sense of why they want to have a nuclear weapon and a delivery vehicle. This is a question that's constantly asked and I think you see in the media, common, North Korea commonly portrayed because it's idiosyncratic as a little nutty. But don't confuse social and cultural issues with security issues. And so here is my rationale, and you can, we can talk about whether you agree with me or not. But to me, the overlying objective for North Korea and the leadership right now is regime survival. That's what they're most interested in. To accomplish that, there are three sort of sub-objectives that they have to, that is about North Korea, that they have to ensure. These intermediate objectives are, one, ensuring that the North, Korean, North Korea is, is safe from attack and intimidation. The second one is to somehow boost their prestige internally. That's internal. The first one was external, from external attack. And the third is economic. So why my argument to you is that in the North Korean mind, and this is something that's very important, in the North Korean mind, nuclear weapons and these long-range missiles and what they're doing, the missiles support all three. How is that? Well, on the nuclear weapon side, uh, nuclear weapons is essentially the poor man's weapon. When you, I've been to North Korea four times. Uh, I met Kim Jong-il back in 2000 with Madeleine Albright, and I've been there on negotiations. When you go around North Korea, a lot of their military hardware is starting to fall apart. It's a very poor country, one of the poorest countries in the world. Their infrastructure is starting to fall apart. Their conventional weaponry, with the certain exceptions, is starting, is very, very old. And when you look at the North Korean soldiers, uh, the Million Man Army, and you compare them to South Korean soldiers, South Korean soldiers, because of the nutrition, many of them are, you know, 5'11", many of them are six foot. When you go to North Korea, a lot of these soldiers that you see, including the honor guard, which are supposedly the cream of the crop, are very short, 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, so there's malnutrition going on here. So, this is the cheap man's weapon. And in negotiations, both when I was in government and then subsequent talks with North Koreans, the North Koreans basically said this to me. If Saddam Hussein had had nuclear weapons, if Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia had had nuclear weapons, if Gaddafi had had nuclear weapons, they'd still be in power right now. We don't trust you. Why should we give you all of what we can do to defend ourselves based on what you've done? This is, again, their perspective. So that's one reason. That's the, the security aspect. And the other thing about North Korea is that from a poor country, once they're intimidated, once they back off, they know that they can constantly be intimidated again. So that's the first one. Second piece is sort of the internal. Well, the North Koreans have, for the most part, integrated nuclear weapons into their culture and the legitimacy of the government themselves. They have literally put an incredible amount of blood, sweat, tears, literally, and treasure into developing this particular capacity at the exclusion of so many other things. And so think about this. North Korea now has this capability, and there are, only, there are very few other countries that have that. Nine other countries. South Korea, their rival, bitter rival, does not have that capacity. And Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il can say, 
China, Russia, and the United States superpowers, we are equal with them. And this is the propaganda, this is what they're, this is what they're perpetuating here. So it's very much part, and it's part of the Constitution. And so them being able, this is sort of their sort of sense of pride and who they are. And finally, and this is relatively new, is the economic piece. The economic piece is that Kim Jong-un, in his first public appearance in April, I believe it was 2012 or 11, I think it was 2012, he made a public speech unlike his father who was more of a recluse. His first public speech did something that was quite unusual. He recognized and stated that the North Korean have suffered a great deal over the previous 10, 15 years, economic deprivation. And he basically said that moving forward, the North Koreans, you've suffered enough, you've sacrificed enough, and you don't, need not do that for much, very much longer. So he put himself on the hook related to economic development. And so for him, nuclear weapons are a way to preserve the peace so they can start channeling resources to the economy as they move in parallel. Now there's precedent for this. Precedent is, very quickly, the United States after World War II. They basically said to East Asia, when everyone was afraid about communism, they said to East Asia, South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, we'll take care of your security. You concentrate on your economy and get stronger, we'll take care of it. And lo and behold, the East Asia miracle happens. China, in the late 1970s, basically did the same thing, Deng Xiaoping. He said that now that our, we have security, we have soldiers, we have to start modernizing the economy. The military is taking too much resources. We have to channel that into economic reform. And therefore, that's what we will do. So in one of the presentations I have, we, I have this great photo of a, something the size of maybe this platform. And it's a cherry blossom tree in full bloom and surrounded by lava. But it's still growing and thriving. And so in a certain sense, that is the idea of what North Korea is trying to do. They are surrounded by hostile territory, and yet somehow, if they're able to protect themselves, they feel that they can survive and get better. Now, they don't have to be at the same level as South Korea, which is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. They just have to show that things are getting better. That's all they have to do. And from a very low level, they are actually doing that, despite the sanctions. So that's my argument. If you look at it again from the North Korean perspective, this is why they want nuclear weapons and why I believe it is incredibly rational for them, for their perspective. We may disagree, but that's the way they're looking at it. You know, we, we typically in this country see this as almost a bilateral conflict, but I'm wondering if you could widen the lens a bit and talk a little bit about the impact that this is having regionally. It's, well, you can see that North Korea was on, the top, was on the top of the agenda for President Trump's trip throughout all of Asia, and the administration is doing a lot to enlist support. One of the major implications, if North Korea does have this small nuclear arsenal capable of hitting the United States, we know that North Korea has had the capability of inflicting existential damage to South Korea and Japan for quite a while now, but if this continues, there is a chance, well, there's a good chance, and what we're worried about Plowshares Fund is an arms race. Essentially, there's going to be, and we see it mounting pressure, even though the President of South Korea said, no, we're not interested, there will continue to be mounting pressure for South Korea to arm. We also know that there's going to be increasing pressure for Japan to arm. They could become a nuclear uh, power in a matter of six months. They have the technology, they have the plutonium, the, the nuclear material that you need to explode at any point, I mean, a lot of it. And so they can do that. Once you do that, then you put in, pull in China, is concerned about Japan. And so what you have then, and then you may possibly Taiwan. And so what you have is this arms rate. I'm not saying it is predetermined or preordained, but these are the dangers. The second danger is, in fact, if you believe these conversations about a preemptive strike or a unilateral uh, strike by the United States on a, a pinprick of some kind, most people are concerned that it will quickly escalate into another conflict on the Korean Peninsula. And for all of us here, war is bad for business, it's bad for commerce, and that is a crucial part of the world economy, and that's why people are worried about it as well. And so the other thing that we need to be worried about too is legitimately so, if North Korea feels that it has a nuclear deterrent, which it does, it may be emboldened to continue its shenanigans. And so one of the things that one has to realize despite 
a different leader. The North Korean government over three generations has continued to use intimidation, bullying, extortion to get what it wants. And now that it has a nuclear capability, there's fear that it will continue to do so and push even harder. Well, just before we uh, open it up for questions and recognizing with Yogi Bear that predictions are always a challenge, especially about the future, <laughs> what can we uh, look forward to or, or perhaps look forward with apprehension to in the next several months? I think you're going to see more of the same, and let me put it in context here. Um, there is another kind of testing going on right now. The North Koreans are doing another kind of test. It is not a nuclear test. It is not a missile test. It is test of the Trump administration and the community around it, South Koreans, uh, the Japanese, and to some extent, the, the Chinese, but mostly focus on Donald Trump. And what, what is that? So I have this, it, what you've had, you have three separate episodes. I think it was the February, March, April time frame where there was a huge crisis blowing up. You had base uh, where there was a fear that there was going to be a nuclear test. Then you had another um, episode in the summer where North Korea launched long-range missile, ICBM, two of them, at the beginning on the 4th of July, which was planned, I'm sure, and at the end of July, which caused a lot of consternation. And then you had the famous, well, the very, I, I was writing this down, just what had happened, North Korea's launch over Japan, the sixth nuclear test, another launch of Japan, and then the UN speech by President Trump and the escalation. So let me describe all three of these and how it's classic sort of North Korean sort of gaming and behavior. And what this is, is North Korean does a provocation first. They do something that they want to pro provoke, but it also has another, it either helps them internally or externally or militarily. So they do something that provokes, they know people are going to get, the international community is not going to like. So they launch these missiles, they do all these things. There's an exchange of uh, rhetoric, and then you have UN sanctions and harsh words by the United States and the international community. You have escalation. Then you have media breathlessness. During these periods of time, I'm getting calls from the media, and they're all talking about war. Is there going to be a lateral strike? So you feel everyone here. I mean, my kids were literally very worried about a war. And then something happens. Somehow there's a pinprick to let all the tension out, and then suddenly people claim both sides that there's a win-win. So let me give you a great, great example about that. So during the second period, North Korea shoots the long-range missile, does it again. Um, Donald Trump, and, and, and then the reason they're doing that is because what a lot of people don't know is that North Korea uh, that the United States during the period of May to July has been doing B-1B bomber runs from Guam. Now Guam we heard about. They're doing it from Guam that goes up to the peninsula as part of the exercises. North Korea hates that. So what do they do? They threaten, they said, well we can play intimidation like you can because again, this is tit for tat, this is escalation. So they say, we are going to attack the waters around Guam. It depends on the translation of what they actually said. So there is a threat to, North, to, to US bases. And then Donald Trump draws a red line. You better not do that. Well, uh, and then after that, the North Koreans say, OK, we can respond to that. So what do they do? There's a big show of the military presenting the plan to attack Guam. And remember, the media was, this was all over the media. So there was a big do about that. And then Kim Jong-un takes that. He looks at it and says, this is a great plan. I'm going to wait and see what the, the United States does. So he walks right up to that edge. He turns around classic North Korean behavior. Now, in the United States, what's going on? Media breathlessness. Are we on a war? What's going to happen with all of this? Is there going to be an attack? You know what's going on in North Korea? Business as usual. They're not on war footing. This is all to them sort of this game. So in a sense, this is a long way of describing that North Korea, and I was talking to Doug last night, of them poking and prodding. 
seeing what this new administration, all these people are going to do and how they're going to react. And one of the things that they realized very early on is Donald Trump is going to tweet. <laughs> he is going to respond. The question then becomes, do those tweets mean anything and do they enhance credibility? Well, with that, I'd oh, like so to... Let me, let, me, oh, oh, let me finish to answer the question. So, so that's round one, two, and three. There's going to be round four, five, six, seven. That is going to happen. We can count on that happening, whether it's another missile test, whether it's another nuclear test. North Korea is going to continue to probe. And I think the ramifications for this are that with each additional test, I mean, additional probing that's going on, my fear, quite frankly, is that the United States is not going to be able to do much, quite frankly. And Donald Trump is going to get really frustrated with North Korea's sort of reaction to this, and that may cause him, and that's one concern that I have, to do something even more rash and, and not very helpful. So my prescription, which I'll say is stop the tweeting, think about what you're going to say. Um, it's not really, you're making the situation worse. My thing about North Korea is don't make the situation worse. It's already bad enough. Fair enough. So questions? Yes, right here in front. Okay, so for the benefit of the rest of the, the room, we'll give the Reader's Digest version of the questions. Uh, haven't we seen this kind of probing before with other uh, U.S. administrations? And what would a post-Kim soft landing for, uh, for North Korea look like? So the short answer is probing, yes, but different kinds of probing in different circumstances. In 2012, there was a different kind of probing that was going on very similar. So if you recall in 2012 and you... You had a new regime. Uh, Xi Jinping just became president of China. You had a new prime minister. You had a new president in South Korea. You had a new president in Taiwan. And in the United States, you had a change of administration in terms of the key players. John Kerry became secretary of state. Chuck Hagel became defense secretary. And you had Susan Rice become the national security advisor. So the North Koreans weren't going to wait for them to get together and say, what are we going to do about North Korea? They saw an opening, and they drove a truck through it, which was a test and a, and a, and a missile a test and a missile test and a nuclear test right immediately. So yes, but there are different kinds of tests that were going on. Back in the Bush administration, when I was in Clinton administration, went to the Bush administration, there was Bill Perry, who was my former boss, talked about we were very close to a deal. And so what happened was that George Bush, that, then Colin Powell said we're, when he came in, uh, Kim Dae-jung, the Nobel Prize winner, came and he's, uh, Colin Powell said, we're going to continue the Clinton policy. Well, then what happened is that the White House heard about it and basically George Bush basically said, no, we're not. And basically Colin Powell got his knees cut out for under him. And the North Koreans were very calm, very quiet. They didn't do a lot of testing because they were waiting to see what the Bush administration was going to do. And then things started to unravel. So there is always this testing that's going on. In terms of North Korea, let me quibble a little bit with your assumption here. I believe, yes, that North Korea as it currently is constituted is not sustainable. The question is over what period of time. It could, we've been hearing predictions for a very long time that North Korean collapse is imminent and it has guided policy and in fact it has been wrong. I believe for right now the, the, the Kim Jong-un administration is in power and is there for quite a while. And ultimately they don't have to worry about the 21 million people. They have to worry about their core. Maybe it's three, four, five million people that they have to keep happy because North Korea is on war footing. 
we can justify a lot of stuff. They justify a lot of things of being on war footing and in constant war. So what's going on is triage. They don't care about the other, 20, you know, the other 15 million, which is terrible. And I, again, I assume if the North Korean, if I could get rid of that regime, yes, absolutely. So they can last for a very long time. And by that time, a lot of things can happen, good and bad. In terms of the soft landing, the, the hope is that by dealing with the three things that they want, security, economics, and some kind of political legitimacy that we can stomach, that their view of their interests will change and evolve, and then will create this kind of soft landing that we're talking about. Okay, that's, that's, that's a hope, but the only alternatives are using force, which we know what's gonna happen, or accepting what they're doing right now. Well, recognizing brevity being the soul of wit and our time ticking away, uh, let's take a question on this side. Yes, sir. So what would the impact of the withdrawal of U.S. troops from the peninsula be? Well, I don't think you should, personally, I don't think you should be thinking about that right now. That being said, you put your finger right on the button in the sense that China cannot solve this problem by itself, but in order for us to get China to work with us in a very productive way, in other words, China has a lot of benefits, they gotta be willing to use harsher sticks for that to happen, there has to be a strategic discussion between the United States and China or the future of U.S. troops in the region should a collapse or the North Korean government change its very nature. Ultimately, what's going on is here, yes, China wants, does not believe, and would like to not have, or one of the goals is a denuclearized peninsula, but their higher priority is to avoid a collapse be precisely because they want to know the future of U.S. troops, because remember, China fought, the Korean, fought in the Korean War and suffered 600,000 casualties to prevent U.S. troops from coming up to the Yellow River on their, on their border. And so the presumption is if there is a North Korean collapse, it would be on the, the successor government would be South Korea, and therefore U.S. troops would be up along the border. And one of the justifications for U.S. troops in the region is because of North Korea. But if North Korea didn't exist, then some of the rationale for these troops would not be there. That's a conversation that has to be had, but, but the Chinese in particular have been reluctant to have because their issue right now is strategic between the United States, uh, is about the United States because they feel that the United States is trying to prevent China from assuming its rightful place as the next, as the rising power. So that's an issue that uh, needs to be discussed. Question for the north side of the house. Steve. So the question is basically, uh, we freeze what we're doing and ask them to freeze what they're doing. So I think the concept that people are talking about, the first step that has to happen is to talk about talks without preconditions. So what has been happening up to this point is the United States has been saying for us to have these talks, North Korea, you have to agree that eventually you're going to de-arm and denuclearize. Uh, you know, that's just sort of a, you're actually negotiating the result at the very beginning. I believe the perfect is the enemy of the good in this circumstance. So the way to do start this is a first a talk about talks as to what the assumptions are, because think about it. The only American that has met and has had actually a conversation with Kim Jong-un has been Dennis Rodman. So we don't know what the North Koreans want. <laughs> and the North Koreans' positions have changed and evolved because of what they have right now. So we, we have to do that. So a freeze for freeze may work. I don't know if it's that. I don't know what the pieces are. But that's certainly a combination that needs to be explored. And what has to happen, though, is that there has to be a pivot, quite frankly, for this to happen 
here in the United States for the administration to allow, to be in a position to go from really where it is in a very harsh positioning to actually being open about talks at this point in time. We don't lose anything by just talking. Uh, and I agree with the administration that the show of force and reaffirming deterrence and commitment to the region, and to South Korea and to, and to Japan is, is critical, and that's what we're doing. And I believe additional sanctions are critical as well. But what is missing is that sanctions has to be to a particular end, and that is a conversation and talks. Because ultimately, as I said, the only alternative that you got is preemptive strike or forcing North Korea, which risks is not an option. I mean, it's a huge risk and war. Accepting. So the only thing you've got is a political solution here. And again, it's a, it's a long shot right now, and it's getting, it's getting longer and longer the more we wait because the North Koreans are getting more and more leverage. Well, try as we may have, we weren't able to sort it all out in one afternoon, but uh, like many issues, it's something we'll, as engaged citizens and voters, stay uh, abreast of. In the meantime, I hope you will join me in thanking our guest, Philip. An MCM production.